Coming up next on This Week in Radio Tech, I've got a cold, but Chris Tarr is here, and so is Sam Wu. And they're going to be talking about what they've been doing over the past year with some good technical ideas, plus a tribute to the late Chris Tobit, who's been gone just over a year now. That's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support, online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics, with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio, audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. So glad you could join us. We're live on Facebooks and on um, uh, Twitch.tv, and then we uh, record the show and put it on YouTube. Uh, and on Facebook so that you can uh, see it later on if you need to. All the shows, or at least most of them, for the past 12 years are cataloged. And uh, well, speaking of 12 years, one of my guests has been with the show for, uh, well, for 12 years. Not every episode, but he's been here. We'll introduce that guy in just a second. Plus, we have a special guest uh, from New Jersey, uh, Sam Wu. He'll be coming up in just a minute. I want to uh, remind you that our show is um, brought to you in part by my friends over at Radio Guide. You can get to their website at radio-guide, radio-guide.com. And in Radio Guide magazine, it's for us engineers, broadcast engineers, mostly radio engineering stuff and uh, uh, all kinds of great articles. And they have room in Radio Guide to give you longer articles. Here's an article by uh, Jeff Johnson called Arc Flash and Arc Fault, Poorly Understood Dangers. That's something that you ought to read. Yeah. Keep you from getting electrocuted or burned from all that. Um, there's a, it's one good article after another, check it out at radio-guide.com. You can go to that website and subscribe to the paper version. Uh, they put out six issues every year. So every two months you get a new issue, just a great thing to leave laying around and read from time to time. And there's a wonderful ad right there from this week in radio tech. Thanks to Ray top for providing us a little bit of space and mostly for providing space for these great articles that are multi pages long. Uh, typically with diagrams and lots of uh, lots of information at radio-guide.com. Okay, let's bring in our guest. Uh, first of all, he's been with us for 12 years on and off, and he's back today. Chris Tarr, welcome in. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Now, the, you know, the other thing about Radio Guide is, uh, I'm sure you know this, but I'm a staff writer, so I write uh, articles for Radio Guide all the time. So uh, Ray's a really good guy and He's like, you know, anytime you want to write an article, just send it to me. We're going to print it. So uh, there you go. But yeah, it's, uh, I was just thinking about that when you said episode 576. Yeah. And uh, I was, wow, I remember episode number one. <laughs> yes, you do. You were here for the first one, weren't you? I was. Yeah. yeah. Boy, that was, I can't believe it was that long ago. Well, that was, and, and I can't believe, I, thought, hmm? I can't believe how handsome we've gotten either. I know. I know. We're just, it's dashing crazy dashing <laughs> we should have a little uh uh, uh spinoff uh, podcast called, we'll call it dashing engineers how about that there, yeah, i don't really want to call it that but uh i don't know uh, well i'll, I'll come up we, with something balder dash engineers maybe that <laughs> well at least it's not balding dash engineers we're good <laughs> with that so so uh uh gee when we started my son had not been born yet uh, cause he's just right. now 11. Yeah. Oh, and you have I a daughter who's that. what, just a little bit older than the show, right? 14. Yeah. Yeah. So 14. Oh my goodness. And I, now I have grandkids In... now. So what? Yeah, I guess I, I knew that you did, but not, you know, I don't think, I think they weren't even born last time I was on. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, let's bring in our guest, a fellow who I met, um, a couple of years ago and, um, I think you've just met him now, Chris Tarr. Let's bring in Sam Wu. Sam, welcome in. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Chris. How how are you? Coming to you from my studio. Thank you for having me on. And where is your studio? In an undisclosed location in beautiful New Jersey. Can't tell you. Can't tell you. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, since I'm I am 
<coughs> excuse me, feeling it under the weather today, and my voice is going to show that or is showing that. And so a lot of this show is going to be a conversation with you and Chris. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I may <laughs> throw in a question every now and then, but I'm I'm so glad. Earlier today, I was really thinking of canceling the show, and I told you guys that, and then I thought, you know what? I think I can rally for one hour, and so we're that. That's what we're doing. We're going to rally for one hour. Tell you what, let's, uh, was, let's no, jump it was, in. It was more like Kirk going, no, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Just, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Get me laughing. I'm going to start. <sighs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure where to start. Uh, our, my intention is to talk about things that we've been doing engineering-wise and production-wise, content creation-wise for the last year and how uh, us as engineers and Sam is also a content creator himself. Sam, I tell you what, before we have to roll into our first spot break, Sam, why don't you tell the story of how you and I met with, it was Chris Tobin who introduced us Chris Tobin. and the, the uh, event and technical circumstances under which we met at a bar and it was crazy. Yeah. Um, Kirk, we, uh, I started a podcast probably in 2017, um, kind of a guinea pig podcast, I'd like to say, called the Let's Go Devils podcast for a variety of reasons. Number one, the team was doing bad, and I, I would go on Facebook Live and just, just really just l let the team have it, why they were losing all the time. They're still losing, by the way, although they did win last night. And... You know, one thing led to another, and Chris and I were, you know, Chris Tobin and I were working together on several other projects beforehand, but when you and I met there, uh, we, we were trying to do something that Chris always wanted to do um, back when he was working with, uh, I guess, CBS Radio at the time or whatever, and was the, the, the live event format and doing live simulcasting on location. And that's where you met, and we had a lot of technical challenges at a place uh, then called PJ Ryan's, now called Taj Lounge 973, where in that particular street in Newark is a, considered a historical district. So when they built the Prudential Center where the New Jersey Devils play, they put the fiber across the street, but because it was a historical district, they couldn't even touch it. Newark, oh. New Jersey has all sorts of rules. So the best internet service they have is old copper service, the DSL. I think the best they can do is two down and maybe 768 up. Oh, and not that's, even a mega. That's, wow. You can't even, you can't even run a, a, a credit card machine, uh, the POS uh, system. So, so Chris and I spent almost about five years, Chris Tobin and I, trying to figure out how to bring internet in. And then what we also found out was the cellular networks were all screwed up. Uh, anytime you have about 16,000 people that were to go to uh, the venue, the Prudential Center for a game, everything would get throttled. So you could go there and do a tech check the night before, the environment changes on game day. And basically, you have nothing down and nothing up. And sometimes this, the cell towers and I, we, Chris and I, one of the one of the games we used to play is when will the cell tower change hands and reset at a certain time? And we literally pinpointed to the exact minute when the internet was shut off on us during a live stream. So oh. there were a lot of technical challenges there, and also uh, when you have about a hundred, two hundred people watching your live video podcast and also streaming it in multiple distribution points there were just so many different uh moving parts so to speak and one of the things that chris tobin always taught me was uh keep it simple but i'm not a simple person but he always said keep it simple keep it simple keep it simple and uh, it took a few years to to put this all together and this is all done before the pandemic. Like, I think Chris Tobin was ahead of his time uh, with the, some of the thoughts he had about, you know, bringing, if you don't have the metrics in the content business, if you don't have the metrics, meaning ratings or numbers, you go where the numbers are. 
and that's the biggest challenge because sometimes that environment is not exactly uh, the greatest. So these podcasts, so uh, I, I wish I had some video. I, I should have arranged to, to send some over to Suncast to show. But these podcasts occur in a bar upstairs across the street from the Prudential Center where the what um, uh, Devil Rays, Devils. New Jersey Devil Devils. Rays. Right. Devils. Devils, sorry, Devils, sorry, yep. Uh, yep. play. And um, uh, it, it's a raucous environment. I, it's r absolutely raucous environment. And you're doing a, not not just a podcast, but you're doing a video podcast, a video stream, right? You've got what, uh, like a radio remote, you got a table, you got people with uh, with headsets like you're wearing now. Um, and you're doing yep. this live broadcast, you bring guests in and it's just, it's a crazy, wonderful environment. But you got to get this stream out of there. Now, you, you produce it right there on site, or is somebody switching the video elsewhere? It could be done both ways. It could, mm -hmm. it could, you know, you could have uh, somebody uh, professional like Suncast do it remotely from his own um, studio, or mm -hmm. you could do it on site. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, the two things that I found in the workflow you must have. Without it, you have nothing, power, and internet. Those are the two things you need to have. Those are your, that's the infrastructure you need to have because you can have all the best equipment in the world. You could have ten, twenty thousand $20,000 worth of equipment, and you can have a five-person uh, crew doing it. But if you don't have power or you don't have internet, you have nothing. <laughs> you, re you really don't. And, that's, and those two challenges, um, because... We learned a lot, uh, pretty much, you know, and you could go back to your episode of hacking the LTE. Um, yeah. That's Chris and I did a lot of stuff together and, and, and shared notes uh, on that. So that's, that's, and like you said, the environment changes at each podcast or live video podcast. And uh, there were times where we were actually simulcasting on AM, FM, and uh, satellite radio in some years on top of everything else because you know i always felt that you know when you want to create content and you need those numbers you need as much distribution points as possible reason why you never want to make anybody feel alienated you want to make it easily available to the end user meaning your audience to consume your content and 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 that's how you build numbers and I, I like in social media because this is what you guys do. I mean, actually, it was kind of Chris used this w w week in Radio Tech, and he glowed about Andrew, Suncast, and GFQ Network, what you guys do. He showed me the samples that you guys have done, and it's just amazing. And it's just, you know, and doing the multi-point distribution, um, I, I like in social media because there's so many different social media um venues out there like Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitch, uh, YouTube Live, that it's kind of like bar hop. You want to be on, you want to be at each bar and you kind of hop along during a live broadcast and start answering questions because people that can then participate uh, in your uh, live video podcast, especially on location, ask the guest questions make some comments. He gives the broadcaster, like myself, if I'm running out of things to say, I just go to Facebook Live and cheat and, and, and hope that people are asking questions and I can just drag out, uh, you know, dead air into a 10-minute conversation uh, with the audience. And they're your online extension of your content. So that's yeah. that was kind of the premise of what we were doing and what you saw at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at the bar with the ruckus going yeah. on. You mentioned that to do a, a live broadcast like this, you need two things, power and internet. And uh, I think a lot of our audience uh, knows about the internet solution that you use, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that for just a minute. Uh, Chris Tarr, um, I, the group that you're uh, engineering for now, that you're in charge of engineering, do you guys do much in the way of live remote broadcasts or, or video remotes? Uh, or was that oh, sure. uh, more with your previous? Oh, oh, you do? Okay. Oh, yeah. No, we, uh, I, for those of you who have been catching up, um, I landed my dream job about a year and a half ago, uh, almost two years now, uh, as director, uh, group director of engineering for a company called Magnum Communications or Magnum Media. It's a locally owned Wisconsin group. Uh, we've got close to 50 signals. So I'm in charge of all of them. 
uh, as well as the different locations and all of the tower sites um, and, and that sort of thing. And, and really, it's interesting you should mention that because one of the reasons I was brought in was to kind of modernize that sort of thing. I mean, this was really, it started out, it's a, it's a family group owned by a gentleman named Dave, great guy, started it from scratch probably 20 years ago with one construction permit and has grown it ever since. And over the years, he's been using contract engineers in different markets and various places to kind of manage things. Well, it's gotten to the point now that there are so many locations and signals that that wasn't working, that patchwork of contract engineers. So he and I have known each other for years and was, you know, trying to hire me for a long time. Finally, the timing was right and I, I joined him. But, you know, one of the things that I had to do was take a look at, like they were still using flip jacks, sell jacks, things like that for sports events. Um, you know, they weren't really utilizing much video. Uh, you know, some of their their transmitter sites, well, one of them especially, uh, you know, was using a really poor quality uh, connection because they thought they couldn't get um, internet out there. Turns out one of the sponsors today uh, is somebody I turned to for that solution. So, uh, you know, that was really, uh, and as Sam put it, if you got to have internet now. And so, you know, I've been working on getting, you know, wireless hotspots for, for our staff. Uh, we're all working remote now, and I don't think that's going to change. Uh, so, you know, I've been having to work with those sorts of solutions too. But for example, I just turned everybody on to Lucy uh, and, and we've been implementing that for sporting events. And that has been, I mean, a night and day change from using a cell phone with a cell jack to going to Lucy and being able to actually, you know, play commercials from there. Um, you know, I've come up with a kind of a standard kit with a standard mixer and headsets and everything that's really easy for these guys to set up and use. Uh, so that's been, you know, that kind of connectivity has become important. Not only that, but I've now uh, put together all of our facilities on one VPN network so that, you know, anybody can, with the right credentials, can connect in and access to all of our assets that we have available um, that they would need to to get to. So, uh, but again, that requires connectivity and security and things like that. So um, that, you know, yeah, I've been doing a lot of that sort of thing uh, aside from, building other things, which you can talk about later. Uh, but, but internet and connectivity has really been at the top of my list. Uh, not only because it's something that we, we really need to have and do right, but I've got so many locations and people all over the state that there's always a little bit of a difference depending on where I go and who the providers are and what's available. So, you know, there's been, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing if you're going to one place every day and you can say, okay, I want to, you know, install decent connectivity at that one place, which I've mm -hmm. done. But then we've got, you know, sporting events and things like that, where it's going to be a high school gym somewhere. And, uh, you know, we have to maybe not rely on the school Wi-Fi to make that happen. So, um, you know, there's a lot more legwork going into it now um, because unlike uh, when I was with Intercom and, and CBS, um, you know, we're small town. We're not small town. We're, we're, you know, we have the kind of a full service kind of thing with a lot of our stations. We still do local news, uh, some, some stations hourly. Uh, we still do high school sports. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of that, that hometown radio thing. And, and, but again, when you're in the middle of, of Sparta, Wisconsin, uh, you know, population of a couple thousand, uh, you don't know what you're going to get for internet, but it's good. It's going to be something really important for us to have. I, I should clarify something that, uh, that, Chris said, he said he turned everybody on to Lucy and, and that, that did mean, I meant means a little in my, in my, in my location. <laughs> so it's, uh, if you go to the website, Lucy, L U C I dot E U L U C I dot E U. And I'll put a link in the show notes. That's some software that lets you do live, live broadcasting from your phone. And it's pretty flexible. Uh, there are other, you know, competitors to that as well. Uh, I became familiar with Lucy software because it works with the, uh, Telos zip one. And that's one um, so of the reasons it, we use it. <laughs> yeah. You can also use it with Lucy uh, server software at the radio station, but uh, it also worked with uh, something a lot like a zip one. Okay, cool. Um, I want to hear more about, about some of that, Chris. I'm going to follow up and Sam stand by. We're going to uh, get to understand your exact solution of getting internet where there wasn't any meaningful internet. And the problem being, or one of the problems being uh, tens of thousands of people across the street, all on their cell phones, doing Facebook updates. We're going to hear about that in just a minute. It's This Week in Radio Tech, episode uh, 576. 
last one of 2021. Sam Wu and Chris Tarr are my guests. And we'll be right back right after this from Broadcast Bionics. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture, and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantec Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Thanks so much to Broadcast Bionics for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. You'll find not only the Camera One system, but uh, plenty of other solutions to help out your social media efforts with your radio station. You can really make a splash on social media, get people talking about your radio station uh, by using uh, just some of the cool software and uh, hardware that goes along with it from uh, Broadcast Bionics at bionic.radio. There's a link in the show notes for that. All right, it's Kirk Harnack in This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, I'm uh, pretty well under the weather here. <coughs> Excuse me. And Chris Tarr is here. He's back after a bit of a hiatus. We'll be talking about uh, Chris's participation in the show uh, going forward. And Sam Wu is here also. Uh, we ought to return to that uh, topic that Sam was talking about, that is doing this big remote broadcast, live remote audio and video. And they were streaming this out of um, a bar across the street from uh, the uh, New Jersey Devils um, and their, their hockey game. So, Sam, um, you, I stopped you before you got to the exact technical solution, at least the one that I saw when I was there and I was really impressed by what you guys were doing. Remember nothing but DSL and really bad DSL in the stadium across the street with, uh, you know, thousands of fans getting ready to watch a, a hockey game. So Sam, what can you add to that? Yeah, I'm not sure if I should be plugging or not. I, I think I am, but, um, but yeah, so Chris introduced me, uh, to a gentleman, uh, his name is Josh Bone. I think everybody knows his name uh, on this fine program. And what I really needed was a reliable solution. Uh, anything that I was using was useless in that environment. Uh, remember, the the internet, uh, the, the the broadband, the LTE service in that area at the time would just throttle, and it'd be unpredictable. But if you did right. it enough times, you would you would literally know that at five fifty eight p.m. AT and T wireless would go down till six oh three, and then Verizon had their own time around that time period. And then when they came back up, there was nothing left because suddenly it's it just doesn't work. And the Max Connect solution uh, was introduced to me, and um, I think well, you know what, I was desperate. And I, 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 I begged to have this service. And uh, by the time it got to my hands, um, I went to Penn State University 
and tailgated. I got it in the mail. I said, I'm going to take it there. I'm going to take it there. And this is a funny story. So I get there, tailgating with 106,000 people, thinking, okay, I'm going to use this internet. It's going to work, blah, blah, blah. And, and not default to Max Connect. It didn't work because I was using Verizon, because that's what I was using uh, at the time. And fast forward two hours later, I was so bummed in the stadium. And during halftime, I realized, and I should have known because that's where I graduated from, that's AT&T country because AT&T sponsors everything of <laughs> Penn State. And I was like, Allah. And then, uh, but I didn't have the AT&T service at the time with Max Connect. But, uh, but anyway, long story short, uh, when I started using it, I started to realize it was a lot different from what I'm used to with, uh, with uh, either business or, or consumer um, broadband. And uh, what I found is it is so smooth and steady and consistent that it, it has bailed me out in a lot of situations. A lot of situations yeah, so- where the environment's uh, harsh. And mm-hmm. when, you, when you and I met two or three years ago, uh, I was just an amateur. Like I just had started to learn how to really use it to my advantage. Uh, learning how to ping the towers, not to go too hard, and, you know, just to kind of finesse it in. And it's really an art form of how you do that kind of stuff. So, um, so what you describe is what I've experienced too. I think a lot of us have. Uh, we might go to a site and using our cell phone or using uh, an LTE hotspot, like a, a MiFi type of device, right? Um, We'll do a test and we'll get, hey, I've got 15 megs down and uh, seven megs up. Uh, this was some, some typical numbers I would get on 4G LTE networks a few years ago. And we think, hey, we can do a broadcast. Um, in fact, I did one in Las Vegas at, um, uh, at the uh, SBE uh, annual meeting and we tested it beforehand. We were getting uh, good numbers up and down. In fact, we were getting ready to do this with, with Suncast and um, we tried to stream video. And even though the numbers, the bandwidth numbers looked good. Um, we were still getting dropouts, consistent, regular dropouts that a speed test maybe just doesn't tell you about. I don't know it was some number of drop packets. Well, I, I did have with me, uh, and we'll do an ad for it later. On. I did. I did have with me the Max Connect wireless uh, service from uh, Josh Bone, and I frankly I was just too lazy. I was easily just using my cell phone as a, as a hotspot. Uh, but I thought, well, I guess we need to break out, you know, the the Max Connect box, which is a four G LTE modem, but it's on its own separate um, APN. Uh, maybe you or Chris Tarr could explain what that means a bit better, but it, it's on a, a, like a separate uh, virtual network from everybody else, right? And so uh, you get a slice of bandwidth that's sliced uh, away. It's reserved for you. Now, I, always, I, I was only getting five megs up and five megs down. So I was getting less bandwidth, but it seemed like every packet was getting through. Uh, uh, this was to cut this about three years ago. Um, uh, Suncast was getting a perfect picture from us, uh, from the, from, uh, the Las Vegas convention center. And so that's the same experience I've had with a, a service like max connect, uh, that, you know, the packets go through because it's a different tier of service. Speed isn't the thing, but reliable packets is, and no contention with others. You're not contending with all those other people using their cell phones you get a slice and it's yours and it's, it's cut out for you. Does that describe technically, Sam, what you guys experienced when you use Max Connect? Absolutely. Uh, like I said, it's smooth. Uh, I think I put more emphasis on the jitter uh, with mm-hmm. the internet um, speed. Again, I kind of, I kind of liken it to, if I'm going to make it a, an automobile analogy, horsepower versus torque. And depending upon what situation you're using, so if you're buying a vehicle and you're looking for top end speed and all that, okay, uh, you know torque is good, but you want the horsepower. But if you're looking for towing, and you're looking to tow uh, twenty thousand, thirty thousand pounds with your pickup truck, I'm just making up numbers. You know, you you want to put an emphasis in torque. And when when I deal with live streaming, everybody. It, it just annoys me to this day because the, the knowledge that, you know, Chris knows and I know, everybody's talking about top end speed. But really, when you're talking about this feed, I just need three meg up and down to be consistent. You don't even need that much. You can always play it around 
uh, with your with your codec, but I just needed to be consistent. I don't I, I don't want anything to drop out, and 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 I I just want that peace of mind with the Max Connect that it will not drop out. Like during the pandemic, when I was doing some contract work, for example, when you know the, the, there was a lot of civil unrest going on in the country. And a lot of CEOs were trying to do these virtual town halls. They basically told me, this better not go down. They, this better not go down because it's such a sensitive subject that I'm doing live. And I, uh, I would have to make guarantees. And we all know that there's no guarantees in life. Even, you know, anything can happen. A, meteor, a meteorite can, can hit us and, you know, sorry, it's, you know, act of God. But people don't care. And with that Max Connect, it gives me an extra tool that I can rely on, but also it, it minimizes the stress of any broadcast engineer that you've got this in your back pocket that, hey, you know what? I can throw the Max Connect on it. It's not 100%. you got to know how to use it, but it does work. It does work in those situations hey, um, in a pinch. Uh, Chris has got something to tell us in a second here, but I just got a message from uh, Tim Braddock. He's uh, one of our faithful uh, viewers, listeners. And, uh, and he said something funny here. Uh, he said, if you've survived a devil's game without wearing beer home, it was a bad game. Is that right? I, what did he say? He Sorry. Said, if you survived a devil's game without wearing beer home, it was a bad game. So a good game, you're going to wear beer home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't get, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, he expressed yeah. it as a, as a double negative, but yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, it. It, yeah. I mean, usually it's a good time. What it means is, if uh, devils are scoring, your beers are flying, and uh, yes. right now they're fourteen dollars uh, per beer. Right now at the Prudential Center, the highest in the league. So hey, oh that's goodness. why they got to. Yeah, <laughs> that's why they got to keep on scoring, keep the revenue uh, flowing in. But uh, anyway, yeah, he he is right about that. All right, uh, let's talk to Chris uh, Chris Tarr for a second. Uh, Chris, have you you've never worn beer home from a Packers game, have you? Oh, uh, you're muted or something's off. Uh, oh, there, there we, we go. go. Um, I I've worn beer, I not beer at cheese and brought ah. home, but never beer. <laughs> You, uh, um, and I didn't intend for this to be a commercial for Max Connect, but we are talking about the technologies that have helped us get through, uh, th these few months, uh, Chris, sure. what, what, uh, what novel use or what use have you found for uh, this kind of wireless? I, tech? I actually, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting and, and, you know, and, and also again, I, you know, I don't think it's an ad in as much, it's such a valuable tool for people who are, uh, are doing this and Josh has come up with such a unique product that, you know, who else there's really nowhere else you can go right now to do this. But, um, you know, Sam really hit it on the head. You know, we don't need speed. We need consistency. And I have a site that is in the literally in the middle of nowhere, you know, at a pasture up in Door County, Wisconsin. And the studio is in Green Bay. Well, we were using uh, or we are using uh, Zip Ones for uh, our STL. And we were doing that over a wireless internet provider who went out of business. So we were stuck or going to be stuck with no internet at all. Uh, and we were, I was scrambling to try to come up with, you know, multiple hop STL and all these other things. And then I remembered that Josh had this Max Connect product. So I did a little research to find out who the best provider was in the area. Uh, it turned out to be at and uh, I had uh, picked one of these up, got their package on there. Uh, put it out the site, and and again, you know, I can't, I I can't under, I guess I I, I when I mean middle of nowhere, I mean it is like, you know, I'm surprised you get cell service at all out there. I mean, this is really in the middle of nowhere, and sure enough, it it, it connected right up, got me a signal, and within you know half an hour of putting it in, I was I had a radio station on the air, uh, using uh, the Zip ones over the Max Connect. And what surprised me is that there are very little, it's running 24 seven and there are very few outages or anything like that with that. We haven't had a major outage at all uh, since we've put it in. I mean, there's an occasional, you know, if they do something on the cell tower or something like that, but um, you know, I haven't gotten any alarms or anything 
Uh, and again, you know, no major failures at all. And so it's just been running 24 seven as our, uh, our, our data connection for STL. And again, you know, it doesn't take much data. We're not running a whole lot of audio out there. It's a, uh, you know, AC codec, you know, we're lucky for running at 128 most of the time and it, it works great. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those products where, you know, I'm, I'm always hesitant to put my eggs in that basket. You know, it's like, well, cellular, what good, you know, but, you know, Josh has really worked out a good deal with these guys with this APN, which gives us priority access on the tower and we get a static IP address and all of these other things. So it, it really solved a lot of problems for us uh, in that, you know, this would have been a very hard link to engineer. And when we had the wireless internet out there, it was great. It was, you know, we didn't give it a second thought because we had, you know, that's all we needed was network connectivity. But when that went away, we were really going to be stuck. And so, you know, this was a great solution. And, you know, we're starting to look at those for backups at some of our sites for audio backups and things like that. So it's a, it's a handy, handy device for sure. Speaking of handy devices, that's a great segue. Thank you, Chris Tarr. Um, handy devices from Angry Audio, one of our sponsors. AngryAudio.com is the website. And I've got a couple handy devices right here. If you're building studios or maybe refurbishing some studios, so often we need one of these uh, devices that goes from RCA connectors, you know, minus 10 audio level unbalanced uh, into some professional gear, which doesn't always want to talk to an unbalanced device. Well, this is the IHF to Pro audio interface from Studio Hub, Studio Hub now wholly owned by uh, by Angry Audio. Well, the where okay, there's there's audio going into this thing from say a CD player, cassette deck maybe. Um, what's coming out though, uh, or maybe you've got a, a barracks uh, a decoder and you need to get that to plus four balanced. Well, right here is that output. This is plus four professional levels balanced on this RJ45 connector, and power goes in right here from the Studio Hub uh, 15 volt power system. This, it's all right here. It's super quality audio. Uh, it's the really nice little box. Easily, you know, you can put some uh, double-sided sticky tape on there, some uh, sticky foam and tape that up inside, or you can screw it down. Uh, wonderful little box. And they do other similar boxes here, like this one. This is for converting um, analog audio, IHF level, that's the minus 10 consumer uh, levels. Uh, into digital audio, AES digital. So you, uh, you, oh, you can also go balanced stereo in if you've got a, a balanced device, but you need uh, AES-3, you come out right here as a digital AES output. And it's also uh, powered right here by the, an RJ45. Again, the Studio Hub standard. And if you need um, headphones, well, we have the Studio Hub headphone amplifier right here. This is in the Decora format. So you can go down to Lowe's or Home Depot or your Ace Hardware store and get boxes that'll hold these uh, just fine. You can get uh, plates that'll go over them just fine, metal, plastic, any color you want. Uh, they, they put two of them side by side if you like, put a whole bunch of them in, whatever uh, you know, decor kind of stuff has, you can do it. And you've got the same RJ45 connectors in the Studio Hub standard for audio in and also looping through audio out. Why would you loop it through? Well, let's say you've got several headphone jacks to install in a studio. You can just daisy chain them one after another. I think the power supply for will run four of these uh, around your studio. So you can have four running off one power supply. Wiring is quick and convenient. You can literally have them wired up in minutes, just a few minutes. Great box there, great little headphone amp. And the rest of the Studio Hub standard, of course, you've got the uh, the adapter cables like these. Uh, so you can go from a some analog device with analog output on XLR uh, into the Studio Hub format. Then you just take a Cat5 cable of whatever length you want. It's balanced audio at that point. You can go a long ways uh, and not pick up any hum, buzz, or in, any any noise, and go into your digital device, whether it's a Studio Hub uh, audio console, or whether it's something like an X Node or a, a Wheatstone Blade or something like that. You can run that in there. It makes your wiring so easy, so easy. I used to wire these for AES digital audio, and I would just let's see, it's the um, it's the green one that is for AES digital because that just needs one pair. Well, they also make this in just the one pair. Uh, this one here happens to be an output, so you can come out of the, the uh, AES digital output of an X node and go into some AES digital input. Let's say an audio processor that has an AES input. You would use that. And they have these in both these, the style that has a female RJ45, so you'd plug a Cat5 cable into that. Or they have these in you know several different lengths. This one's a six-footer right here, 
So you go a, a six footer from the analog output of a, some audio device uh, into um, the RJ45 there. And that's about six feet worth of cable. Lots of convenient and pretty ways to wire up your studio accurately and all with high quality and all gold plated contacts because that's the RJ45 standard. Check it out from angryaudio.com. Go to the website, angryaudio.com. You'll also read about the, the headphone disconnector, uh, the Bluetooth audio gadget, and so many more cool things from Angry Audio. All right. Hey, we've been talking about Max Connect Wireless. And I tell you what, I think we've got a little quick video clip here about Max Connect. We'll be right back after this testimonial. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. Max Connect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the Max Connect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It's also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. Here's what uh, John Tocock is talking about. This is a Max Connect wireless 4G LTE modem. Uh, this one happens to be a Cradle Point one, but there's others as well. And it's not the modem that makes the difference. It is the SIM card that's inside. In this case, it's a SIM card for Max Connect wireless. There's a link in the um, in the show notes. Or you can go to Max Connect. I know it's spelled funny. There it is right there on your screen. Max, M-A-X-X-K-O-N-N-E-C-T dot com. And check that out. Josh Bone has done a terrific service for the broadcast industry in inventing this great way for people to connect. And that's that's one thing we've, we've been talking about here. All right. It's time to get back into our show with uh, Sam Wu and uh, with Chris Tarr. Um, uh, Chris, I wonder if you could... Uh, yeah, you've you've done so many projects this year. I'm sure you've got a, a, a mental list of a bunch of them. Maybe you've got uh, something that you'd like to show us or talk about for the next few minutes. And after that, I'm going to ask Sam to talk about this interesting uh, project that he and Chris Tobin had been working on before Chris passed away. Uh, but uh, Sam is taking that project uh, on himself and, and moved it forward. But Chris Tard, what would you like to uh, fill us in on? Oh, boy, where do I start? So, uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier how... Uh, there wasn't really uh, one engineer for the group overseeing everything. So everything was kind of a patchwork of uh, contract engineers. And oh, by the way, uh, about three or four months after we, I got hired in the middle of pandemic, we bought like six radio stations. So <laughs> I had all this stuff going on, but it requires a lot of changes and a lot of upgrades and a lot of rewiring. So I took just, a, I have a couple of pictures. I, I could have hundreds of them and we'll save that for another show, but I picked out four pictures of some of the things I've been running into. So we'll start with the first one, which is tower site. And what that is, is that is <laughs> we had an AM tower site that was overgrown with uh, just trees and, and bushes and everything else. And as you can see, we found some things in the homeless camp. Um, it's just, you know, again, it's amazing the kind of things you see. We It was this completely overgrown AM power site. And I said, well, we got to, you know, we're going to completely cut all the foliage out. You know, it's, it's just good engineering practice, but those are some of the things we found. And I actually had one of the police officers come by and I, I gave him that stuff to get rid of it for us. And he said, yeah, you know, we really appreciate you cutting down the trees and the, and doing the trimming because we've had homeless encampments here and we've had some, some crime issues. And he said, now that it's cleared out, they're not going to come back here. Uh, so that was, you know, that was just one of those really interesting things I'd never run into before. Um, wow. the, uh, yeah, it was, you know, and it's, it's sad. It really is. It speaks a lot for, um, you know, the world we live in, but, uh, you know, it was just amazing how, uh, you know, this, this, tra this site had been neglected for so long that, um, uh, you know, it was just, I, I remember when they were showing me, taking me on the tour, and the contract engineer said, oh, yeah, I just had to replace this lock because, you know, somebody had broken in and they were living in the building. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, oh. you know, I think there are other things we can do to prevent this. You know, if if they can hide, they can take all the time in the world to get into the building. So, you know, I didn't want to make a compound or anything. I mean, that nobody really wants to do that. So I said, well, we just got to get rid of all these trees. So we came out with a bunch of equipment and just cleared the whole thing out. And we haven't had a problem since then. 
Um, another interesting project I have been working on or had worked on, and if you want to bring that up, that's one that says Hoka. Uh, we bought um, a group of stations in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And the issue there was we were grandfathered in. We already had a couple of stations in the market, so we couldn't buy the entire group of radio stations that was for sale. However, uh, translators don't count against the market cap. So we did this kind of a multiple deal with a couple of groups. We picked up, I think, three of the full power stations and picked up two translators. So we engineered the translators because of the terrain and everything. They are almost have the same coverage as a class A. Um, this is a rack that I was working on. I, I obviously you could see by the wiring it wasn't finished, but that's two radio stations. Uh, but what I wanted to point out was all of the Kirk Harnack gear that's in there. Uh, the <laughs> Zip One, the Omnia Five, and the Cutting Edge Unity. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was an interesting one because we had to uh, we we took the stations over at midnight, and it, all these changes and spinoffs took uh, took place right at midnight. So at midnight, we had two stations that went to other owners, I, and then I had two translators that had to be put on with the formats of the stations that were moving. So all at once I had to reroute all of this audio and we have Axios. So it was pretty easy to do, but it was one of those really weird, probably never happened in that market again, where like four radio stations that night in the middle of the night changed formats. Uh, oh. But I had built this in advance to make all this happen and, and get them all on the air. So uh, that is uh, that is one picture. Then we've got one that's labeled before, and this is at our Fort Atkinson facility, uh, where again it was a facility we had we had bought, and we buy obviously buy and run these these stations in smaller towns, and come they come with some smaller station issues. This being one of them. Um, this was a rack that was down in the basement that had the STL gear and the processors and things like that, and. As you can see, it uh, it was a little messy. So I went in and tore that all apart. And then we've got the after picture of, uh, of what happened after we got it all taken care of. So, oh, nice. Um, yeah. So those are kind of, you can see the, there's the Axia node down there in the bottom. Um, it, it's interesting because we have upgraded all of our sites uh, to at least have X nodes for the backbones. And now we're building some out with the actual surfaces. but um, the, the people in the group had never, you know, they've heard of Axie, but they never saw it in, in use. And as I started to roll out these new stations that we bought, I started there with Axie right away. And as soon as they saw the flexibility there, they were sold. I've been putting them in at, <laughs> in all of our buildings. In fact, I've been waiting because they've been backordered. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it kind of goes back to, um, you know, the, the interesting part in all of this where, you know, you hear a lot of times, you know, small stations getting knocked because, uh, you know, owners don't want to spend the money or, you know, that sort of thing. And the reality of it is I've found, especially, you know, the, the people that I work with, they do want to spend the money. They just want to know that it's going to, it's worthwhile money and that there's a, there's a good return on investment and it, it's something that helps them out. And when I've been doing these upgrades, one of the other things I've done recently was replaced all of the streaming computers. And I found one model of a small, kind of a small form factor PC with a certain load of, a, of software that's exceptionally stable. So huh. I bought 20 some of those <laughs> and deployed them everywhere. And, you know, that that is, um, again, there was some expense there, but now we have streams that never go down. So, you know, I found that, you know, these owners and, and the, the gentlemen I work with more than willing to spend the money for that kind of reliability. But, you know, there wasn't a lot of people that were that experienced that could, you know, follow through and explain that to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I looked at and said, well, you know, yeah, these, these distribution amplifiers are nice and everything else, and these old switchers, let's see what we can do with, with an Axia node. And I put that in and it was night and day. All of the noise from the analog switchers were gone. Uh, you know, we put Axia drivers on the playout machines. And he's like, they, they just sound like, you know, I put in Omni 11s in some of our, our locations. It's like, these just sound like brand new radio stations. He's like, I can't get yeah. over it. 
and it's it's money well spent and and that goes for again clearing out transmitter sites and things like that so that's why this has been a lot of fun for me uh, because uh you know i i first of all the buck stops with me so the entire i'm a vice president of the company so um you know i'm in charge of, of that sort of thing so i get a lot of leeway into making those decisions uh on on how i want things i just have to come up with a way to explain and 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 have my uh, my employer understand what i where i'm going with this and we we've known each other for so long that we've built up some trust for that but he sees the results you know he sees you know when he built out these translators and i you know buy high-end you know shively antennas or you know stuff like that get a good tower crew out and you know buy new transmitters um the performance that we're getting out of these is so amazing and again it, it doesn't cost a lot more to do it it's just how you spend your money and so that's that's been fun and, and it's it's just been a non-stop doing projects like this uh for a year and a half now and and he and i were laughing because i think we're putting our last new translator on on a, in, in first quarter and when that's done that's it <laughs> for now and you know we've put on i think five or six or seven of them this year and uh, he's like, we're going to sit back and be bored. <laughs> and I said, well, I hope to be bored for a little bit. But then we've got, you know, it's kind of like painting the Brooklyn Bridge. You can start working on one station and get all the way to the last one and have to start over again with the next set of stuff for the stations. So, you know, it'd be nice to get it a little more of a routine. But it's been it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, doing some of these projects. And, and it's certainly been, uh, you know, a learning experience for me. And, and it's been a little different working from home now. Um, I don't have an office anywhere. I don't need one. Uh, so that's been a little different, but, um, I'll tell you, I get to do so many fun things and, and get to go out in the field. I still get to go out and play with transmitters. Um, I, you know, I do have a, an amazing staff of engineers that just do fantastic work. Uh, so, you know, I get to learn from them and I get to lead this team and do some, some things that I've always wanted to do. So it, it's been a lot of fun. So you mentioned something that, that really, uh, piqued my interest, but I, you may have skipped over it on, on purpose. Um, the computer with the cut of, uh, I assume, operating system software that seems really stable. Uh, can you can mm -hmm. you reveal anything about that? Well, it's it's not anything. It's not anything exotic. Um, it's just especially uh, a load of of Windows ten that I have configured and removed a lot of stuff in. Um, mm -hmm. And we use uh, we use um, well, it's not Wide Orbit anymore. Odyssey bought them, but Wide Orbit streaming. And mm -hmm. I have a, uh, I, I buy uh, licenses for uh, Hans's software, a uh, stereo tool. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, sure. As, as well as some other auxiliary things. Plus, it all runs on Axia for, for drivers. So, you know, basically, there's no sound cards in these things. It just comes in off the Axia network, um, runs through stereo tool and the virtual audio cable, and then comes out into the encoder. But with the stable software, you know, they just never shut off. And with the with Hans's software, they sound so good. I mean, it just the audio quality is fantastic on them. Uh, so that alone, I mean, we had a mix of Windows XP machines and different outboard processors, like you know, Behringer boxes and things like that. So even just that one thing made such a huge difference for our group because we have an app that has you know all of our stations listed, and you'd hit one and you didn't know what you're going to get. You know, was the stream going to be up? Was it the audio going to sound okay? Was it going to have any processing on it? You know, some of the stations were taking feeds off of tuners, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So a lot oh, yeah. of that is yeah. just kind of go, yeah, going through and, and, and taking a look at, you know, what's the best way to do this and then doing that globally for all of the stations. And I've been given a lot of uh, leeway to, to do that um, because he, you know, that's, you know, the most important thing with all of this is being able to show those results. So, you know, I did one, one cluster I did with the new software and he heard it and was like, oh yeah, that is amazing. Let's do it. And so I went and I, I did it everywhere else. You know, same thing with, you know, Omni 11s and, you know, all these other things where I, you know, they're, it's not the cheapest thing in the world to do, but after I show them the results, it's like, well, yeah, that's, you know, we're in the business of, of, you know, connecting clients and, and listeners and advertisers. And, you know, if we've got something that sounds this good, I mean, that, that's a home run. So it also helps that he's very engineering oriented. Um, he's, he's a real, he's a radio guy, 
And, you know, he, he, he and I have a lot in common. We both started in, in radio on the air in high school and, you know, we just went different paths. I went into engineering, he went into ownership, but he really appreciates good engineering. So as I show him these things and we, you know, we do all these things with ubiquity links and codecs and things like that. Uh, he just is, he loves it. He, he just is like, it's a lot of fun for him. So that helps yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, and I'm not not to beat a dead horse, but on that on that Windows uh, thing, um, sometimes yeah. you can buy, and I'm I'm not sure you're supposed to be able to buy, but sometimes you can buy the Windows 10 Enterprise, uh, long to LTS long term support yeah, version, right. and and that right. comes without all the bloatware in it, and I've used that when I could buy it, and again I'm buying it off people on eBay. I've had good luck so far; they've all installed, the licenses have all worked so far, um, but you know that's. To me, that's something that, and, and you can absolutely turn off updates on that. Uh, so yeah. just update them when you're ready to. Uh, but that's something. Yeah, and you that, can that, you can get the that. you can get the LTS if you're a business. You can get the business license for it. Uh, um, uh. And there are hacks out there to do some of those same things, which is kind of what I do. Um, you know, we spend some time with it uh, in in the markets where I don't have a Zip One for Lucy. I put Lucy servers on them, uh, the server software. So. Uh, you know, it's just been a, you know, you take the time to kind of figure it out and learn it and, you know, reliability, uh, again, just across the, the company, reliability is important. And, you know, we went from, um, you know, we use Simeon for playout and, you know, we had gone from, you know, at least once a week, some station being silent or off the air for a couple hours to, you know, we count it now in minutes a month for 30, oh, you know, yeah. 30, 40 yeah. stations. But it, again, it just kind of took me looking at each situation and going, okay, you know, I know in this market, these machines run really, really well. What are we doing there? And let's do that everywhere else. Um, you know, uh, these streaming boxes are really old. Let's find one standard that we can mm -hmm. buy bulk software for and deploy them everywhere. And, and mm -hmm. so now when we, when we bought those stations, um, this, the six or seven stations over the summer, uh, we could come in with our stuff and just go, okay, here are the streaming boxes. Here are the, the automation playout boxes, you know, we're already configured and they, we just plug them in and go, but you know, there it's, it's a standard rollout now as opposed to, okay, what is the local engineer going to find to put in there? And is it going to be similar? Can we make it work? Um, just even those simple things made a whole lot of difference in the reliability and operation of the group. Chris, uh, don't go away. I'm going to come back with you uh, right after our next spot break. Um, Sam, uh, in our just a couple of minutes, uh, tell us about this iPad project that you and Chris Tobin uh, had been working on. And, and uh, what, what is it? How does it uh, further your business? And what does it do for the people who use it? Well, um, about 10 years ago when I met Chris, I was looking for an IP solution. Uh, he was working with CCS at the time. And mm -hmm. I told him that uh, I wasn't really happy where things were going because uh, I was still using ISDN solution for satellite radio. And uh, I wanted to go more mobile and do live events, you know, on, on satellite and AM FM radio. So through over time, and the, we're talking about about eight years that we decided to try different things and develop an ecosystem. And we call it voice, video optimized internet conferencing ecosystem. I wanted something that is simple because normally when you're dealing with broadcasters or what they call talent, they're talented at talking on air, but to be honest with you, any broadcast engineer would understand they're not talented turning on the machine and, and remoting in or doing any of that. So we needed something simple, mobile, and an ecosystem. And we came up with this um, iPad contraption using an iPad interface called Menlo, where you can um, put in Ethernet, have an XLR, quarter inch plug, something simple. We didn't need to get anything complex. We needed to get from point A to point B because in my mind, the only two things that you need really is power and internet. Well, we got that part figured out. 
but we needed a conduit, an easy barrier to entry to create content. And we created that ecosystem before the pandemic and we're always refining it. But when the pandemic happened, um, Kirk and Chris, that we realized uh, that the ecosystem could be modified in so many different ways that it didn't have to be just for live broadcasting, uh, AM, FM radio, because we used to put the Lucy app on here. It worked reliably. There, there were no problems. It was so easy because everybody knows how to use an iPad, but not everybody knows how to use another codec uh, when you're talking about talent or broadcasters in the field or CEOs now, because now I've gotten out of uh, conventional media and have done a lot of uh, live virtual events, both hybrid and fully virtual. And I deal with a lot of C-level executives that are very smart in their field, but guess what? They don't even know how to turn on even an iPad. So, you know, that's what we have to deal with. And we wanted some easy solution uh, that very simple, but can do big things. And I don't know if I should do the big reveal, uh, Kirk, before we go to break, but the iPad that Chris was secretly testing for me, he was using two years on twerk on this week in radio tech. And yeah, after well, he passed I, away, I'm yeah. actually using, I'm actually using his right now because uh, I was able to get it back uh, from his wonderful family. They were, they were great in the process of trying to locate it, but it was always near him. And uh, Chris would always report back because I'm always looking for data. What's the problem, Chris? And he's always said, nothing, nothing. Everything works fine. I was like, does anybody know that you're using it? He's like, no, no one has said a word. I haven't said a word. And he was true to his word because every person I talked to uh, surrounding Chris Tobin knew nothing about it. Knew, uh. <laughs> knew nothing about it, which is funny, which I'm actually doing this whole uh, live podcast with you guys on right now. We, uh, we might need to have you back um, if we want to look in that more in depth whenever you're ready, because uh, we're just about out of time. Um, yep. Sam Wu, I want to uh, be, because we won't be coming back to you on this episode. I want to thank you so much for your participation and telling us about thank you. Uh, what Chris, Ta uh, Chris Tobin had been working on uh, with you. And yes, I knew he was using an iPad on some shows. I didn't know it was the, the super secret uh, Menlo. So. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, I don't want to hype it up too much, but the whole point of the project where anybody can use it, anybody yeah. can use it and can figure it out. And that's, that's actually a lot harder than it seems. Good deal. Sam, well, good to see you. I'd uh, love to have you back again sometime and maybe we can do a show together uh, in person uh, across the street from a devil's game. Uh, absolutely. Just let and, me know. Uh, if, we, if we can overcome the noise <laughs> in the bar. <laughs> I, I've actually hey. figured that out. <laughs> yeah. It's This Week in Radio Tech, episode 576. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Chris Tarr and I will be right back in just a minute. Hang on. Hey, what's happening? St. John here coming to you from Command Central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio. I'm talking about, boom, Wheatstone's Vox Pro. Lots of different audio software out there. Why Vox Pro? It's the only software designed to do what we needed to do, which is record, edit, playback in real time. When I say lightning fast, I'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in Vox Pro right now. Literally three clicks on the controller, mark left, mark right, everything that gets marked, you hit delete, it goes goes away. It's literally that fast. So we're going to take this part right here. Boy, help. Nine. Boom. From caller nine to him saying, I'm ready. Five. I'm ready for that secret sound. Boom. All of that stuff. Hit delete. It goes away. Here's your edit. You are tackling secret sound. Caller nine. I'm ready. So one of the best features of version seven, this is awesome. It's effects macros, and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and EQ it and all that, you can literally build a chain. One button, this button, this one's called call right here. I just click that. All of those processes happen instantaneously. Final thing that I love about Vox Pro, and there's so much more to get into, but uh, one of my favorite things, you can load it on a laptop. I've literally done my show from a hotel room in Armenia to uh, the conference room at, yeah, this was fun, jury duty. Great thing, no one could tell the difference. Vox Pro makes it totally easy. I'm telling you, if you're looking for the best on-air partner, call my friends at Wheatstone, ask them about Vox Pro, and you'll be glad you did. 
This Week in Radio Tech brought to you in part by the Vox Pro from Broadcaster's General Store at bgs.cc, bgs.cc. Go to their website, bgs.cc. Call them at 352-622-7700. Good folks, really, I mean, really good folks at Broadcaster's General Store. Hey, uh, Sam, uh, thank you very much for being on the show. I know that you, um, you know, as we said earlier in the show, it's been just over a year since Chris Tobin's passing. And Chris was a big part of our show, uh, half the show, really, for um, uh, uh, for 11 years. And uh, so we miss him very, very much. Sam, we have a tribute video that we're going to play here. Um, if, if Sam, if you had just a, a, a sentence or two to say about Chris Tobin, um, I'd welcome you to do that right now if you want to. Absolute professional. And uh, that's about it. He was an absolute professional and a kind man. Uh, he taught me everything I know, and yeah. and I'm very appreciative uh, uh, of his time and effort and uh, his vision of what he and I wanted to do. Yeah, good. Thank you. I feel the same way. Yeah. Chris Tarr, you uh, worked with uh, Chris Tobin, but mostly right here on This Week in Radio Tech. Um, did you have a, a thought or two about Chris Tobin? I, what, what, the first thing, there are two things that come to mind when I think about him, and I do a lot, is a sense of humor. Uh, he was just, he was funny, but in, not in a, in a goofy kind of way. He just had this really dry, fun sense of humor. And, you know, he, he would, ju you know, you would, you would f at first think that he was serious about something. You realize this is all just a big long con coming from him. And I would laugh. And then, you know, the other thing was just how kind he was, you know, I, I more often than not. And, and he and I actually only met in person once and that was at NAB. Uh, but we talked all the time, either through twerk or email or whatever, but he would just send me a message. Hey, how you doing? You know, everything okay? Just checking in, making sure things are good. And, you know, I have very few friends that do that. And he took the time to do that. So um, just a, a really kind, funny, smart guy. And I miss him deeply. We're going to roll a, a little video that Suncast has put together about Chris Tobin. It's a video that we intended to show um, close to uh, yeah, 11, 11 months ago, but we just didn't get a chance to. And uh, we're going to run it for you in just a moment here. But we also have an announcement about uh, Chris Tarr. Chris, is this as good a time as any to uh, make such an announcement? Uh, well, I, I suppose. I mean, you are the father. Oh, not <laughs> yes. that one. Sorry. Or something else, something else. <laughs> uh, I should have had a quick comeback for that, and I just don't. Um, <laughs> you missed me, didn't you? You missed me. <laughs> yeah, we missed you. Well, you had, for, for a, a number of years, you were not a co-host on the show. Even You started with us, and then you had to leave for a while because you got real busy. And now you're yeah. in charge of everything, and you get to set the hours, apparently. So uh, I do. Well, you know, the, the hardest part was it was at four, it's four o'clock central time on a Thursday, mm -hmm. which meant mm -hmm. I was sitting in my office at work. Well, now I don't have an office. I have, well, I have my home office, but you know, I'm the guy in charge. I'm the big man on campus. I am the big cheese. So my calendar is my calendar. So what does this mean for this week in radio tech? What's your participation going to be? I'm back. <laughs> Okay. Does this mean that uh, maybe every now and then I could have a week off and you could just host the show? Now, let's not get all, you know, <laughs> let's all get ahead of ourselves or anything here. Uh, yes, that would uh, certainly mean that you could take a vacation. I don't know that I'd recommend leaving the show in my hands, but you could do it. <laughs> well, I, I, in all seriousness, uh, when Chris Tobin passed away, it was such uh, an emotional blow uh, to me. and. Um, I, I felt like the best thing I could do was just to soldier on and host the show myself uh, without uh, any help for a while. And that while just kind of felt like a year was about the right amount of time. And uh, Chris, I approached you what, a couple months ago and said, hey, would you would you consider coming back on the show and co-hosting on a, on a either a regular basis or a pretty regular basis? And you said. Absolutely, I'm in. Absolutely. Good, good. good. All right. I mean, I can't, you know, obviously can't fill the shoes of, of, of Mr. Tobin, but I have a feeling that he would be very pleased with the arrangement. 
Well, most of us could not fill the shoes of each other anyway. So, um, and, and before we close out, because again, mm -hmm. this is something that I know, uh, I, I know Chris would get a kick out of, um, how things kind of come back around again. So I spent a lot of time at transmitter sites, uh, you know, doing different things. And I'm always worried. I've got my, you know, thousand dollar iPhone here. And I'm always worried that, and it's happened where I'm going to drop it and break it or whatever. So I decided to get a second phone for when I'm out at work. It is mm. a flip phone. Oh my it is God. a honest to God, Android flip phone. <laughs> that's it's made by, uh, it's got cat branded and it's, it's dust proof. It can take falls on the concrete at six feet up. Uh, so dust proof, waterproof, it's run a stripped down version of Android, but it's a, it's a flip phone. So now, you know, wow. when I'm at work, that's the phone I use so I can keep my, my iPhone in the car. But yeah, I, I just, I can't believe that you could actually get flip phones. It's just, I, I can't wait for you to, to text me back using T9 texting. <laughs> <laughs> this actually has a touch screen on it, but you know, maybe I'll do the T9 just to make you happy. Hey, we need to, we need to run this video. Chris Tarr, I uh, look forward to seeing you again many, many weeks in the years ahead. All right. Um, all right. Now, without further ado, uh, Suncast, uh, let's fade to black and roll this tribute to Chris Tobin. Uh -huh. 